always like to give it a minute to boot up because I had some technical difficulties a few times. And so, yeah, I'll, that'll give me a chance. I can I can reshare the link to remind people that it's happening right now. Yeah, cool. All right, it looks like we're live. So, Tyler, thanks for coming on and taking the time to have a conversation with me. Would you mind telling us a little bit about yourself before we get started? Uh, sure. Uh, my name's Tyler, obviously. Um, I uh, am the, the host of the Free Thinker podcast and blog, which is a, kind of a – it's not all dedicated to apologetics with atheists. I mean, I do, you know, inner – uh, kind of ecumenical things dealing with differences between Presbyterians and Baptists and biblical theology and just kind of anything that that uh, that strikes my fancy uh, that I'm studying at the time. Uh, I'm currently working on my master's in biblical studies um, at Reformed Theological Seminary. Um, got my undergrad degree in biblical studies from Moody Bible Institute. And my first degree program um, was from a secular state school here in California in uh, uh, as a double major in philosophy and English. Um, so I've been working through, uh, uh, a lot of these issues for, uh, almost 20 years now, um, uh, became a Christian in college, um, after actually taking a, in the middle of a metaphysics class with an atheistic professor, uh, he actually, uh, uh, convinced me that naturalism was false and it was kind of a, I mean, I would say an uphill road since then you might say downhill, I don't know, perspective matters. Um, but yeah, so that's been kind of my journey ever since. So came out of a uh, naturalistic atheism. Um, and so that's been really my interest in, in dealing with, with um, kind of fil the philosophical side of theism is, is how to engage specifically that. So I don't do a lot of apologetics with like Islam or Mormonism or anything like that. It's just, it's not my area of study at all. I am almost completely ignorant of it. So. All right, cool. Moody, is that in Chicago? It is. Yeah. Right downtown. I just met a few of uh, a few someone representatives from Moody. There was a conference here in Minnesota. Yeah, they were. Yeah, it was a really cool meeting. I've been talking about the conferences they have coming up. Hopefully, yeah. I'll set up something with the professor there soon too. Yeah, some some uh, some Moodyites. Yeah, yeah. It's funny that <laughs> the, it's called Moody uh, because it's named after D. L. Moody, who was the you know the 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 evangelist and, uh, and and Bible commentator. Um, but like all of the you know how you get like sweatshirts for your your school and stuff and you get stuff for your parents and it's like ucla mom ours is always like moody mom <laughs> you know yeah it's funny so you just definitely get that for your mom like this is you yeah. yeah this is for you i'm not saying anything it's the school i go to i can't help it yeah. love you all right so uh just just to jump right in uh, i'm an atheist by which i mean mm -hmm. i don't believe there's any reason to believe in the existence of god could you tell me what reasons you believe there are and then i'd like to tell you my position on those reasons and i'd like to hear your thoughts on my position sure absolutely yeah um i you thank you again for being patient with me you've been trying to schedule this for a while and i've been like kicking the can down the road and having to reschedule and flake on you and my life has just been insane so thank you for your patience i really oh it I wasn't all you because I, I think i had to reschedule once or twice also uh i don't think i don't think we had anything officially scheduled i think we're like would that work and you were like maybe no it won't but i was the one that was like we have it scheduled i need to cancel like day of i'm so sorry so that you, you've been you've been great about it so i appreciate that um yeah so uh so some of the reasons uh that i believe in god um, and, and why I think that God is the, the best explanation for things are, uh, honestly manifold. I think there's a cumulative case. Um, but primarily I think that God functions, um, and I'm going to give, I'm going to give what I think are defensible, you know, reasons that I can give that someone else should believe, not something like personally veridical reasons, like the testimony of the, the Holy Spirit. Those might be reasons why I personally believe. I think you're more interested in reasons why anyone at large should should have reasonable belief, right? Yeah, I'm more interested yeah. in like the philosophical concepts. I yeah. don't usually argue against people's personal experience. Yeah. Um, so <clears throat> I think that God uh, is is the best explanation um, for all of the features of reality that we see. Um, so uh, and I, and I think He does this as a singular, simple explanation. 
Um, so, uh, for example, some of the features of reality, why there is something rather than nothing, explains the one and the many, the existence of the laws of logic, the existence of objective moral values and duties, why there's persons, why there's minds, why there's coherence between uh, our, our interpersonal mind and the external world. Uh, the what uh, I can't remember who it said, but it was something like the, and I'm going to butcher the quote, uh, but just the, the insane applicability of mathematics to reality. Um, I think that there is evidence uh, from uh, the historical reliability of the Bible, its life-changing power over, over history, uh, the evidence from the empty tomb and the resurrection of Jesus Christ, so on and so forth. Now, before you say, okay, well, we can talk about each one of those. We can talk about each one of those. I'm just, what I'm saying is that I think that God can actually serve as a singular function or a singular explanation for every single one of those. So when we're looking at what a good explanation is, we're looking at, does it have a uh, high explanatory power? That is, can it explain the data under question without lots of uh, modifications, uh, that, that it's not ad hoc, um, that it has explanatory scope? So can the singular explanation explain lots of data and other questions without needing to multiply explanations? Um, so I, you know, on, on Christian theism, we have a single explanation for all of these things where on something like naturalism, you would almost need a different explanation for each one of those questions. Um, uh, so I think you have explanatory scope, explanatory power, the low amount of ad hocness, uh, you have explanatory simplicity, uh, so on and so forth. Um, but my main reason, and I and I listed as one of those, is that I think that God is the best best explanation is and and the possible grounding for something like uh, a realm uh, of transcendent and absolute laws of logic, such that uh, without such a being existing, um, there there's no reason to 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 understand why there would be anything like a transcendent realm of laws of logic within a purely naturalistic world, um, and and such that um, as far as I've heard, I have not heard any really compelling alternatives uh, to this explanation as a powerful explanation. Um, so for me, not only is it a, a powerful singular explanation, simple explanation, um, there also doesn't seem to be really any uh, any strong rivals to it. So all right, uh, that, that's the that's the basic layout for it. Sure. So to I agree with your uh, argument that there has to be essentially one explanation for all of these different things. You can't just have like one explanation that explains one thing and then a different explanation that explains a different thing. So I would say that all of these can be explained equally as well by naturalism as they can by theism. To take the transcendental argument, for example, uh, you said this is required for to be grounded in the mind of a god of kind of something to explain the transcendental nature of math and logic and um, those kinds of concepts. Mm -hmm. But from my perspective, those are simply descriptive. If you go to like the Stanford Encyclopedia of Philosophy and you for formal logic, it says logic is a formal language like Visual C++ or Visual Basic or HTTP, any kind of coding language. It's just a language made up by humans to describe reality. So reality exists and reality is the way reality is. And then logic and math simply describe those. They're not really transcendental, they're just languages. So they're about as transcendental as English, pretty much. Well, let me, I mean, if I could respond to that, I don't sure. want to cut you off. I, I mean, I, I would simply say that that um, what you're doing is is confusing ontology with epistemology, right? So there there's the difference between the ontological reality of logic as a feature of reality and the language that we've come up with to describe those laws of logic. So when we say something like the law of non-contradiction, we could talk about the law of non-contradiction ontologically. Um, what, is, what does it mean to say that a contradiction cannot be instantiated? Um, then we can talk about, well, what do we mean when we talk about you know, the, the, the semantics, the, the, the terms and the words and the descriptions that we use uh, within language to describe that? Those are two different questions. I'm not talking about the, the 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 semantic, the epistemological question. I'm talking about the ontological question. So if I were to ask you, not just because, well, let me ask you that. I mean, did you think contradictions could obtain before humans existed to create the conventions of the laws of logic as you've described them? No. Right. So we're going to say that there's something to logic that is actually not contingent upon our convention, our inventing of these descriptions. There's something objectively real about them that is ontologically distinct from the conventions that we've created to describe that reality. Well, I would phrase right? it differently. I would say that it describes something that exists. So the contradiction can't mm -hmm. exist because it describes a real thing. 
The right. logic itself isn't a real thing. It's just a language. Uh, but it describes like reality. Reality can't contradict itself. So it's not the fact that logic exists and prevents reality from contradicting itself. Reality just can't contradict itself. But but the question is, why is it? So, so the, again, the, the, the law of non-contradiction is a semantic description for a reality of non-contradiction, right? In reality, something cannot exist and not exist at the same time. It, it, it's governed, it's ordered by um, this, this law of non-contradiction in the ontological sense, not in the, the, um, in the epistemological sense of what we have come to describe as, right? So we could, we could talk about, okay, well, there is, there is the law of gravity. There's the force of gravity that exists. That's an ontological reality. There's then the epistemological, that's not quite the same, uh, but there's there's the the question of how we have come to 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 ascribe to ascribe semantic markers to describe that reality. I'm not talking about that aspect, the semantic aspect of it. I'm talking about the reality of it. So there has to be some type of um, of logical law in the ontological sense that actually has to be beyond uh, objective reality. And the reason for this is. Um, it's not merely a feature within nature itself, right? You would be, you would actually, if you're going to say that it's a feature only within reality itself, it's just a feature of, of matter, for example, or something along those lines, you would then be forced to say, well, it doesn't actually, it's not a feature of the universe at large. So it could be possible that the universe exists and not exists at the same time because this is because there's a feature within reality, but it's not something that governs that that governs all of reality as a as a whole, right? And I'm going to say, well, I mean, if that's the, if you're going to argue, if you're going to push that position and say, well, it's not actually an ontological reality, right? Because you've already now moved from it's something that we've invented to admitting it's actually a feature of reality, and now I'm going to say, well, is it a feature of contingent reality, or is it a feature that contingent reality is is a block? I don't mean obliged to in this in 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 the in the personal sense, but that it's governed by, um, and in that sense, it has to be transcendent and absolute. Otherwise, you're backed into the corner of saying, "Well, then the universe can exist and not exist," which I'm just going to say, "Okay, well, at that point, you've given me the argument because then you've just basically said, "Well, you know, to hell with logic; things can exist and not exist." Uh, on your worldview. And I'm going to say, well, I mean, then if your worldview is logic enough such that it violates logic and things exist, not exist, then to hell with your worldview. I just don't find that very compelling. I want one that consistently abide by the laws of logic, no matter what the question is. Right. right? So, so I just, I don't think that, I don't think naturalism can serve as a foundation in the same way that Christian theism can, where it can ground, it can ground the turtles all the way down it doesn't have an, a stopping point where it just needs an axiomatic and somewhat inconsistent uh, grounding for it. Right. So I think that uh, the laws of logic, the semantic epistemology side, that part requires a mind because we invented that part. But what it actually describes, the ontology is just a feature of reality. It's a part reality itself can't contradict itself. That isn't because of some kind of transcendental laws of logic. It's just that's just a part of the nature of reality itself. So Why? why it just is like why if you ask if I was why ask you I, I, it, here's this 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 is this is why so this is this kind of gets to the rub of it so the na at that point you're saying well naturalism doesn't have an explanation for that it's just an axiomatic assumption basically my worldview can't account for that so i just have to say it is it's just a brute fact right you would never allow me to get away with that in my worldview right you'd never allow me to say well you know i uh, i believe in the supernatural why because it's just a brute fact why, why, why does it exist? I don't need an explanation for why it exists. It's just a brute fact. You would never allow that for my worldview. And yet you want to allow it for your worldview when it comes to a feature of reality that your, your, your worldview can no longer ground. You just need it as an axiomatic truth, right? Because you don't want to, you're, you're a smart guy. You don't want to throw, you know, logic, you know, you don't want to throw just caution to the wind, say, you know, to hell with logic. You know, I can't explain it. Therefore it's no good. You want logic to function within your worldview. But when I back you up until you get to a, uh, you know, kind of a backstop rather than actually showing, well, my worldview can actually show why and how the laws of logic exist and why, um, why existence is ordered according to, to principles of logic. You can't, you don't have that explanation. So you fall back on its axiom. It just, 
It just has, it's just brute fact. It just has to be that way. Right. Um, so, um, so my, so my worldview explains one more thing than your worldview can. So, right. My argument is that naturalism can explain everything equally as well as theism. So you're saying that your God's nature is essentially a brute fact. And I'm using essentially the same argument to say that nature's okay. reality of it being uh, logical is a brute fact. Right. Here's and, the difference. Well, well, Here. the, one, the difference is it's the fact that you've added in a God mm. unnecessarily. So I can get That's rid of the, the God difference. and just keep the necessary uh, nature to explain logic. So here's the, here's the difference. So the difference is that you and I likely agree the natural world is contingent. The, uh, unless you think this world, unless, unless you're what's called the necessitarian, where you think that this world, every feature of this world as it exists in this world is a necessary fact. Um, this world is a contingent fact, in, including the, the, the sum total of things. It's contingent. It's not necessary. Um, so it can actually not account for itself. It's a, it's a contingent thing. It's not a necessary thing. Whereas the concept of God is a necessary entity, right? So again, nat again, all, all I'm saying is, and, and here I'm not even saying naturalism is false. I, I can argue that, but my point here is not that nearly that naturalism is false. It's to rebuff the claim that you said, well, naturalism can explain it just as well as theism can. And my point is it can't because naturalism unless you want to affirm necessary to uh, necessarianism, um, which I, that's a, that's a tough road to hoe. And I, and I see you, I, I saw you smile when I say it. I think you know that that's a nearly impossible to position to affirm unless you want to affirm that you have to say that naturalism, it doesn't account for it. It just has it as a brute fact, but it's not an explanation for why it is that way. Whereas I'm saying, well, Christian theism explains why it is that way, right? So Christian theism has the benefit of, expl of being having explanatory value, explanatory power over that question of reality. Whereas it's a mystery on naturalism. It just exists as a brute fact. So again, that doesn't mean naturalism is false. It just means that when we're, when we're putting those things on the scale, naturalism doesn't have the explanatory scope over the existence of laws of logic in the same way that theism does. Theism wins out on that explanatory power. Right. So just like you believe that your God to be a necessary thing, I can say that there's a property of nature, which is itself a necessary thing. So it can offer an equal grounding to theism in the same sense that they're both um, asserted as being the necessary grounds of everything. And their nature entails logic as a consequence of their necessity. So I can Are you a necessitarian? That. No. So then you can't say that. Yes, I can. You, uh, how, how, if this world, so if this world is not a necessary world, if you're not a necessitarian, how is it that this world can, the, 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 the innate logical structure of this world can be a necessary fact? Because you can have different possible worlds. There only has to be one necessary thing that has to exist, one necessary property. And then from that, there could be lots of contingent properties that exist. So, so then example, it's not... So then it's not a necessary fact. It's a contingent fact. It's 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 contingent fact of this possible world. No, no, no. So you this, could this have possible, another possible no, world. No, 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 no. This possible world is contingent. And there is some necessary thing that our world emerges from. So then uh, so then the laws of logic are transcendent to this possible world. Yes, they're trans they're tied into the necessary thing. Okay. So the so then you've just then you've, again you've just admitted my case that the the laws of logic are, are are transcendent realities that are not actually contingent features that are not features of this world alone they are transcendent features that govern this possible world we agree on that then no, not exactly so when we're talking about worlds i mean like our universe as opposed to all of nature all of reality so our universe can be contingent and there's something more fundamental, which is necessary, like, for example, the multiverse, just to throw out a hypothetical. So, and then logic so be, is grounded in sorry. the nature of the necessary thing, like the multiverse. So it's still a part of our universe. Our universe is just not the source of logic. It's logic just describes our universe. So then you're, so then, I'm, I'm somewhat confused then. When you say, when you say, when you're talking possible world, so when we're talking necessity and possibility, typically we're talking about like modal operators. When you're saying possible, you're, you actually mean like, um, like multiverse possible, like not, we're not talking about modal logic. We're, we're now in the world of, uh, of, of, of other worlds within the multiverse. 
Well, well, there's two kinds of necessity and contingency was the distinction yep. I was going with. So necessity as in the ground of everything, and the contingency is something that emerges from that, which isn't a necessary fact. It's just a possibility. Okay. And so, all, so then, in that, I think I understand you. So, I mean, so correct me if I'm wrong. So, I'm, I, my original argument had to deal with with ne with with necessity and contingency in the modal sense, right? Um, where um, we're we're talking about uh, possible worlds and necessary worlds, right? It seems like what you're saying is that well, this local expression within the multiverse, the laws of logic might might be outside or or transcend this this. Uh, this local universe, this, you know, I'm going to use this term sloppily, physicists are going to freak out, uh, this bubble universe, um, where the laws of logic might be a feature of the multiverse that transcend this, this, this bubble universe within the multiverse. Is that where you're going? Yeah, it transcends our universe, but it's still just a feature of nature. It's a feature of the necessary okay. part of nature. Okay, then all you've done is push the problem back. So then I can ask, well, can the multiverse exist and not exist? Right. And I'm saying there is some feature of nature which is itself necessary in the same way you believe God to be necessary. So it doesn't have an option. It has to exist. It is a necessary thing in nature. So does the multiverse necessarily exist? Well, that was just an example. So I wouldn't I wouldn't use the multiverse in that sense, but I'd say there is something in nature which ca cannot not exist. Is that a is that a faith based commitment or do you have do you have any type of uh, uh, of, of reasoning to, to think that that's the case? Sort of. So I can say that all of the arguments and evidence you use to indicate a God work equally as well for this thing. So I totally don't well, no, well, no, no, it, it doesn't. So, and, and, and I've listened to you enough to know kind of your, 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 um, your argument style. And I, I don't mean this pejoratively. I mean, I have an argument style. If you listen to me enough, um, the, the, it simply is not the case that these conceptual competitors are, are, are equal competitors. So, um, so the the multiverse cannot explain the laws of logic because again the question can apply. Can, it, it, you have to argue that the multiverse is necessary to sustain the claim that the multiverse is therefore a rival concept to the existence of God. Because in order for it to be a rival concept, you would need to affirm that the multiverse is a necessarily existing thing to stop as a backdrop. Right, right. Um, to clarify, the multiverse is a physical theory. It's a part of physics. It isn't a necessary thing. It isn't a stopping point. It's just the next stage in scientific discovery. So I'm not making right. a scientific alternative here. I'm saying there's something beyond that, which I call naturalistic pantheism, that there is some fundamental, eternal, all-powerful aspect of necessary nature. We just haven't discovered it yet. Yeah, and and so I and I would push back and say, okay, and and this is this is where we're going to continue because I've heard you bring up you know flying spaghetti monster and naturalistic pantheism and naturalistic panentheism have you gone to panentheism uh, i think no. i've heard that in the past I've, couple. I've used panentheism but i haven't called it naturalistic okay. panentheism um and we can get and we can get to some of those the problem with all of those is that in order for them to to come as rival concepts they have to make all, you have to keep making all these little ad hoc adjustments to make them similar concepts Right, so so I can say, well, one of the reasons why, uh, so there, there's more to the existence of God that is the explanation that is, has explanatory power here than just the necessary existence. Not only do I think you haven't sustained the case for for necessary existence because you haven't actually argued for it, but also the the existence of of God as a personal agent um, is um, is part of the explanatory power because we understand. Um, what when, when we're talking about the laws of logic, we understand that that what it means for um, for laws of logic to be um, you know principles of true thought. We understand what that mind means for a mind to do that. Um, we understand um, how we can avoid something like an infinite regress when we're dealing with a personal agent who has a volition um, who could have created something in the finite past. Um, uh, you know why, why there's something rather than nothing. We understand. Um, when you're dealing with a Trinitarian uh, personal agent, why that can resolve something like the problem of the one and the many, right? You would need to start making successive ad hoc adjustments to your naturalistic pantheism, to flying spaghetti monster. You have to say, well, flying, we don't actually mean flying spaghetti. We don't actually mean spaghetti monster. We don't actually mean monster. What we actually mean, we're going to redefine that to be an eat to be a conceptually identical thing to what you mean by God. We're just going to call it a flying spaghetti monster for it to work, right? So, so what you're saying is, in order, you know, flying spaghetti monster is a competition. If by flying spaghetti we monster we mean exactly the same thing as God, okay? Well, arose by the name, then you haven't actually presented a rival option. Uh, but, but the point, 
the point here is that in just saying kind of this, this you're, you're throwing out this, um, this ad hoc imagined, well, I'm just going to talk about this, this omnipotent, um, you know, universal, natural that transcends all of reality. Okay. Well, at that point, it's, I don't know what you mean by natural then at that point, you have to mean that it's a non-natural natural, which I'm not so sure that, uh, I don't think that's coherent. It's kind of like, and I'll, and I'll turn the screws on you a little bit. It's kind of like saying naturalistic pantheism. Well, pantheism is just that, uh, is just that the divine is coextensive with the natural to say naturalistic pantheism is just almost say uh, non-divine divine, which I mean, a married bachelor by any other name is still incoherent. I'm not even sure what that means. Um, but to say that you're dealing with, uh, you know, um, a, 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 a natural transcendent thing, well, by transcendent, we just means that it's, that it is outside the natural. So I don't even know what that conceptually means to say a natural transcendent thing, right? So you already have to start making these ad hoc adjustments, which to me is going to say, well, God is still the better explanation then because it, it, I don't need to make these natural, you know, the, these ad hoc adjustments to what the concept and the words even mean to make the explanation fit like you would have to do to make these ad hoc adjustments to make it even a rival concept. Does that make sense? Yeah. So firstly, by natural, I mean known natural as opposed to unknown natural. So anything that goes beyond the known natural could still be unknown natural as opposed to supernatural. So it transcends the known natural. Um, secondly, naturalistic pantheism isn't my term. I didn't invent it. It comes from the Stanford Encyclopedia of Philosophy. So you're going to have to take that up with them if you think I, it's inconsistent. I, mean, I, I, I would. I would. I it... I mean, it's it's largely semantics. You, it, well, you, it's it's published in academic peer-reviewed papers. So if huh? you're going to argue against that, you've got a, quite a bit of um, academic uh, controversy you're going to have to go through. So that's way above my head. Which I'm fine with. I mean, I do the so, same thing with what I think is the redefinition of atheism. So, which I, which I, I don't mean to interrupt the point. I I actually have well, f actually finish your point, and then I'll ask my follow-up question. All right. So so uh, my definition of naturalistic pantheism just means eternal, all powerful, necessary nature, and those three properties can explain everything. So I don't need any ad hoc changes. I can just show you how those three properties can explain all of the different aspects. So there's not an ad hoc change at any point to different to change it. It's always those three or one property depending on well, how you, you. Well, there would because because now you're by by saying the natural thing is a, is a necessary you're actually become you're you uh by default the the, the logical implication of that is that you're a necessitarian you'd have to be right because if if there's no personal agency determining i'm going to create something at, at this given point right if it if it's if it's simply by natural processes and and by natural we can now mean multiverse natural whatever that means um if it if it's simply cause in cause out then there's no explanation there there if it if it existed eternally and necessarily, this universe would have come into existence necessarily eternally in the infinite past, right? The fact that we have a finite beginning for this um, uh, means that the that that there's you can't appeal to to previous natural law, right? Because if it just came about naturally without any personal agency it would have come about naturally because there was an infinite amount of time prior to the beginning of the universe for the natural process to work themselves out. The universe would have come into existence necessarily in infinite past. Well, no, we right? can prove that false immediately just using the examples of particles. We know that particle decay happens on the quantum level. There's infinitely many, an infinite amount of spectrum when it could decay, but it decays at a particular time due to quantum fluctuation. So we know that there are natural properties that are allow for a, an actual infinite, and it can specifically pick a number uh, in that infinite to cause it. So like I can just pick 42. There's infinitely mm -hmm. many numbers before 42. Well, quantum physics can do the same thing. So there's no problem with saying the universe was created yeah. to exist at a particular time with an infinite past. We already know of natural mechanisms that can do that. Except you already you already inserted yourself in a finite timeline, so that that's the problem with that with that example. So you you already well, well, have a finite beginning. No, no, the quantum mechanics exists before space and time, independent of space and time. So it's it's not. I, I understand. I understand. But what I'm saying is, when we're talking about something like particle decay rates, you're already dealing with a finite timeline where where if if that if that if if that naturally and necessarily was going to occur, if you have an infinite past. 
right? That would have already that would have already happened. So in in saying that, you're either ignoring the the finite past of the created universe, or you're begging the question of an in, eternally necessarily existing universe, which may be a faith based commitment for you, but you haven't demonstrated it yet. Well, so no, 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 no. Again, that's the in quantum mechanics, time and space are emergent from something else that exists independent of all time and space. So there is no the finite time thing is irrelevant to quantum mechanics and the decay of the particle. That happens independently of the timeline. That's why there's infinite an infinite amount of time it could decay, but it decays at a particular time because it's independent of time. So, okay. so that argument doesn't work. But you're you're already this, we're going to go down a rabbit trail here because you're already dealing with you're already dealing with the finite timeline no, 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 and you're no, 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 actually no. dealing so, with the finite creation. I apologize, so, I apologize. so anytime yeah. I say quantum mechanics, the finite timeline is gone. It's out of the window. There is no finite timeline as soon as you go to quantum mechanics. All time is gone. But so, you're OK. OK. We're, well, I mean, we're going to we're going to we're going to simply disagree on our on our understanding well, of quantum I mean, mechanics. I can, I can and I don't quote, think either of us are specialists. So I can just quote Neymar, Kani Hamad, and Sean Carroll, who specifically say time and space and matter are emergent from things that are predate time, space, and matter. Or and and I can quote De Broglie, and I can show that there's different interpretations. I mean, we can we could go down all these things. I, the, let's go back to what the actual. The, well, the, no, no, the no, no, no. This is this kind of is. important. So here is a natural theory given mm -hmm. in physics, which exists outside of space time, that can explain exactly what you just said couldn't be explained. So here's one way where I just did it. I mean, it may not be. The only way to explain it, but that's one way to that gives a naturalistic explanation to create but a universe with an infinite past. But you're already appealing to something that's within with no, that's no, within no, no. the I, universe. I've already, that we're I've already said it's false. So the quantum no. mechanics is outside. You can claim it all you want. So do you think? So for example, do you think that quantum mechanic applies to the multiverse? Uh, yes. How do you know that? Uh, it's just assumed based off the math. So it's just assumed. Well, the mathematics doesn't describe the multiverse. We yes. our mathematics what? breaks down breaks what? down at the at the point of inflation, right? No, no, so, no, 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 no. I apologize. Uh, the math, uh, the the multiverse is a specifically a result of two mathematic equations. One is the vacuum state, the vacuum energy, and the early universe inflation. So it is actually described by the math. It comes directly from the math. Okay. Uh, again, we're we're gonna we're gonna disagree on on, on your understanding of of all of that. That was just uh, a direct quote from Sean Carroll. I have, I can just give you the quote, and and that's fine. Again, I can, I could give you quotes from other people who are going to disagree with it. So, but, but it doesn't I matter for people who disagree with it. So, I have an example that just refutes your okay. claim that this can't be done, and it's supported and I, by. And I have an example of people who are going to disagree with that that's supported by physicists. We're we're just going to get into a battle of experts who have differing opinions on these things. Well, no, no, I grant there's different opinions. That's not the point. I just here but is then one can't... possible example that it, that can do what you're saying can't be done. We have we an example that... that can do it. It doesn't okay. need to be the only possible one. It's just it's you would you would have you would have to demonstrate that that's the case in order to that to be the case. Well, no, no, you, you would have. You to, don't get, get to assume case. the benefits of the conclusion of a questionable finding. You wouldn't again. You wouldn't allow me to do that. Right, right. I agree. Right, so, so why so do you allow yourself to do that? Well, no, that's the point. Is I'm using essentially the same thing you're doing. I'm just asserting here's a possibility that can explain it, just like you're asserting here's a possibility okay. of God that can explain it. Yeah. So they're okay, equivalent fine. explanations. They can both explain it. Okay, I'm gonna try. I'm, I keep trying to get us out of the bog. So let me ask you this then: Do the laws of logic apply to the quantum to the quantum realm? The laws of logic describe reality. So yes. Okay. Do it's so. Do, do the laws of logic apply to the quantum realm? Sure. Okay. Why is that the case? Because it's a part of reality. Well, laws of because logic describe reality. Because it's, so you so the, so whether or not you're dealing with multiverse, whether or not you're dealing with quantum quantum uh, the quantum realm, whatever whatever it is, you're backed up to it's brute fact. My worldview doesn't the the worldview doesn't explain it because the worldview just is oh you your your position is my worldview can simply state that this is a fact of reality. And how is okay? that different from that's not an that's that not an God. that's not an explanation. So it's pointing to and saying, well, I can affirm the data of reality. I I can just say that th that's a data point of the data point of reality. Okay, right, that's not that? an explanation. That's not a that's not a grounding or an explanation. That's not how explanation works. So your worldview doesn't account for and doesn't explain that data point of reality. It just allows it as a brute fact of reality. But and that's not is, an explanation. How is that different from saying your God has a particular nature? That seems to be no different from a brute fact of claiming nature has right. a particular nature. Right, be because God can exist as a necessary entity, can actually explain those features of reality. Nature can exist it, as a necessary entity and can actually explain those features of reality equally. But you're, but you haven't, you're, nat nature existing as a necessary fact doesn't explain why those brute facts are facts. God existing as a yeah. necessary being doesn't explain how those brute facts are brute facts. 
it actually does. Oh, so. it, we, it, it, God existing as a God existing as a necessary entity as a personal agent explains why there are laws of logic, which are principles of true thought. That actually grounds it and explains it. Well, actually, I think you're confusing the epistemology and the ontology here. So you're saying I'm that- not. I'm, I'm not talking about the epistemological description. I'm talking about the principles of rationality. Well, again, the principles right, that, 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 are that exist the, outside of our descriptions of them. Principles are descriptions. That's what the word principle means. So uh, principles are, are not mere descriptions. Principles have an ontology beyond the descriptions of the principles themselves. Again, you're you're what? you're conflating the ontology of, of of the statement of the fact. You're you're confusing the 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 ontology of the fact with the with the epistemology of the statement of the fact. Well, principles are by definition only epistemological. There's no ontology of principles. It's a contradiction in terms. Principles are just descriptions of things. Uh, I'm again. We're gonna we're gonna have to disagree uh, simply on that. So I, I I disagree that principles are merely descriptions. Uh, right. So, so, you, so we can, we can have principles. Um, like, cause, cause so I, for example, I can just Google the philosophical definition of principle as a foundational truth or proposition that serves as a, a system or belief or behavior of certain reasoning. So it is descriptive. It literally mm -hmm. just describes. You're, you're, you're assuming that that simply means that it's descriptive, right? So, so, um, so, uh, so we can think of, uh, has to be. uh, uh, let me try, let me try to think of a good, a good example. Um, let me. Uh, so we could have something like um, like natural law principles, um, right? So so you could have something um, uh, a natural law principle, a principle of justice, for example. Um, that the the existence of a principle of uh, of a just principle um, does not itself mean that it's merely a description. Right, we we would say that justice, the, the there there's a specific ontology of justice. There's specific relational ontologies. It's not merely our description of something. Uh, yeah, it is. I don't. You know. don't think just you don't think that there is a, such a thing as justice the in the actual fact, apart from apart from our descriptions of it. So if there is a principle of justice, that's like saying the law of or the the description of gravity. So the description of gravity is necessarily descriptive. Like I just give the gravitational equation or something. Right, but does gravity does gravity does the principle of gravity exist? No, the principle just describes gravity. Gravity exists, but the okay. We're arguing just... semantics. I'm I'm referring to the the the, the substance of the principle itself. So, I mean, the, you, you're you're going to get quagmired in 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 semantics yeah, all you of, want. I'm kind of lost here because there is no substance of a principle. A principle is just describing the thing, and the thing has a substance, but the principle isn't the substance. That's confusing the map for the territory. No, it's not. So, so let me let me back up. You're trying to say that natural this 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 uh, this necessary natural thing, which you're trying to avoid necessitarianism, which I'm not sure is avoidable, can explain uh, contra non contradictions, for example, right? Uh, yeah, because because that because that's my argument is that the existence of God, a personal agent, can just can can ground why the universe behaves logically, right? Because the existence of a, of an omnirational mind is just a logical mind, right? And so therefore, what it creates would would abide by that, right? It it, it can explain and ground the facts that we observe in reality. So, so if reality existed without a God, could it have contradictions? I don't think that is. So I, I'm going to go back and say, I don't think it, it's meaningful to say, uh, and, and you're not going to grant this, but I, I think the conclusion of my arguments is that since God is a necessary being, saying reality that exists apart from apart from a God is like saying all flibble forps are swivel swoops. Um, it's like saying a married bachelor. I, I, I'm, you would have to demonstrate that that's even a possible thing in order to even argue that as a, as a rival concept. Well, you're saying that um, theism explains the laws of logic because there is a mind that grounds the laws of logic, and that's why the universe behaves and doesn't break the law of non-contradiction. Is that right? About right? Yeah. Uh, you, you added a step. But yeah, I mean, the, so, the, so, but the, the, reason, the reason why we would expect to find, uh, and, and again, we're 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 uh, we're standing on we're standing on God's lap to slap him on the face. The reason why we can even have this rational logical con uh, conversation about the laws of logic is because logic is because we live in a we live in a logically contingent universe. We live in a logically contingent cosmos. You could expand that. You could again. You could push that back to the multiverse. You could push that back to the quantum realm. The question is why does it exist that way? Simply saying, well, naturalism can explain it because naturalism. On naturalism, it, it's true. 
on naturalism it exists, all you're saying is naturalism explain it because it's a brute fact of reality. But again, that's not an explanation. That's simply appealing to brute fact. Whereas I can say, okay, I can push that one step further and I can say, I can actually give an explanation for why that's the case in reality um, rooted in the nature of God. Now, again, that doesn't mean naturalism is false and that doesn't mean theism is true. What that means is that theism, Christian theism, can provide an explanation without the need to appeal to brute fact. So from my position, nature of reality, it works. It's, it has abductive power that naturalism does not. So I'm not following your argument here. So from my position, I am in a necessitarian in the fact that law, the laws of logic can't be otherwise, essentially. So reality is the way reality is, and it can't not be reality. And right. you're saying that the only reason that's true is because there's a mind to ground that. And I'm saying it couldn't be not true regardless of whether or not there's a mind. So it seems like you've added an extra oh, step. There. Oh, why? If, 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 um, if nothing existed, I understand the problem of, of, that, of that type of semantics. If nothing existed... It, uh, asking about the laws of logic would be again like asking about Flibbleforps and married bachelors. It just it's 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 a meaningless question to ask it. So if we're dealing with um, um, what is the is the what's the reason why something can, why the laws of logic are are immutable, right? Simply saying, well, my explanation of the laws of lo why the laws of logic are immutable is because the laws of logic are immutable. That's just a tautology. You're not actually providing an explanation. This is the problem with appeals to brute fact. You're not a. You're not actually giving an explanation. You're just there's milk in the fridge because there's milk in the fridge. Okay. Well, but, but why is there mean, milk in the fridge? But does that mean because you're saying the fact it, there's milk in the fridge? But does that mean you're saying the laws of logic could be otherwise? No, because God is God is a necessarily existing person. Well, if they couldn't be otherwise, then they don't need an explanation. They're just axiomatic. So that's, why? Do that's you... no, that's not the case. You're con you're confusing axiomatic with necess necess uh, necessity, right? So just because something is necessary doesn't mean that it has does not have an explanation for its existence. Or it doesn't need an explanation it, if it's necessary. It just means that it exists necessarily. Right. Right. It it does not mean that it and 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 again. This is why I asked you what if you meant modal necessity and contingency, right? Because you could have something that becomes a, that that is um, uh, contingently necessary uh, once you get starting getting into modal logic, right? So, so um, the laws of logic are necessary facts because they are reflections of the mind of God, right? That doesn't mean that they're a brute fact. It doesn't mean they're without explanation. They have a grounding for them even though they're necessary. Okay, so so you're saying if God's mind changed, then they would also change. Uh, but then again, uh, the concept of God just is that of an immutable being. Well, that's, that's irrelevant because this isn't that arguing for soundness, it's arguing for validity. If your argument is true, if I said like A is B and B is C, therefore A is C, it doesn't matter if I'm saying dogs are cats and cats are chickens, the consequence is that A is C. So if you're saying that the laws of it, logic are the way it they It does are, matter because if you're if you're going to ask then the further question, well, if God can change his mind, again, if you're dealing with an immutable no, being, no, no, that's, not, like, saying, that's like saying if, if the chicken was a dog. No, no, again, so the soundness is irrelevant here. I'm saying if you believe the laws of logic are contingent on a God, then necessarily if mm -hmm. God's mind changed, then the laws of logic would change. I'm not saying this is possible. I don't care if it's possible. It's irrelevant. But, All I'm but again, saying is that the, 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 the proposition, because you're dealing with a necessarily immutable in, in concept, right? The proposition, if God's mind changed, is like saying if a bachelor was married. That doesn't matter. It's just, it doesn't matter. It's, just, it's, it's a meaning. It's validity, not soundness. So if I say... But your 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 where you're going for requires it to pinge on no. that that proposition has concept that has has content to no. it. No, but again, this is only about validity. I'm not saying anything okay, about soundness. So I can, I can finish, finish, the, finish, finish the syllogism. No. If God's mind changed, that's premise one. If uh, that's 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 the antecedent. What's the consequent? Then logic would change or something like that. Which I would just deny the premise then, because the antecedent is like saying, you know, if a flibble fork was a swibble swoop. Well, again, that, a meaning, you can't do that. You cannot statement. do that. That's not an option. So if I said if A I, is B, you can't deny A, because it doesn't matter what A is. But I, 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 can't, is I can't. I can't. So so let me let me ask that. Okay, if a, if a bachelor was married, therefore he'd have a wedding day. Yeah. No, you no, agree no. with so, that? So, I'm you agree that so, you can, so you can't do that. You can say if A is B, then C, and I'd have to agree. I have to say this is valid. 
So I could say, oh, great. If if a if a bachelor was married, he had a wedding day. The 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 married bachelor had a wedding day. Therefore, the the married bachelor was married. Yeah, that's valid. That's a cool. valid argument. Cool. So, so I would, I would agree that if, good if, good so if your premise one is true, then your conclusion is true. So that is a valid argument. Great. So so I'm asking the same thing about your case of God. If God's mind changed, then the laws of logic would necessarily change. Correct. Okay. So that would mean that the laws of logic could be otherwise in some sense because they're contingent the laws of logic are contingent you can have contingently necessary things this is the fun with modal logic you can you can you can have these all these fun modal operators right plus again in order for you to actually because what you're trying to and this is why i'm saying you're trying to sneak in a soundness objection into a validity <laughs> objection this is why i keep saying you don't get the benefit of that conclusion right you're, you're trying to get the benefit of your validity conclusion as a soundness objection. And I'm saying, okay, well, fine. The, 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 the objection that you give is formally valid. Sure. But you don't get the benefit of the conclusion because the, 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 the argument itself is unsound because the premises are incoherent, right? So you, you, you don't, you don't get to sneak in a benefit of a soundness objection through the back door. That's just, this is why I keep saying, well, that premise matters. Um, so I, you don't get to have your cake and eat it too. Um, but go, but going back, so we 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 focus on we focus on the laws of logic, right? We we can keep moving on because I, I'm sure most of your audience wants to get into other things. I'm and then, and this is where I was curious. I'm I'm curious what type of atheist you are because depending on on what type of atheist you are, I might have a completely different out. So I'm going to ask you if you don't mind. I'm I'm going to turn the tables. I'll be interviewing. I'm going to just ask you a couple of questions sure, sure, go um, because I don't want to I don't want to give an answer to a position that isn't yours. Right. So are you the kind of atheist that agrees with, I would normally say redefinition, but I'll be, I'll be nice and say the definition of atheism, that it's merely the, the, the autobi the, the biographical description of the lack of belief in the existence of God or gods. Oh, no, I use my own definition. So it's slightly different than that. What's your definition? There's no uh, reason or evidence that indicates the existence of a God. So you actually would affirm kind of a philosophical atheist. So you wouldn't affirm that something like, well, uh, theists are atheists with regard to all other gods then. Uh, no, I wouldn't say that. So I would say that okay. the default that, position is imaginary until demonstrated otherwise. So I'd say God does not exist because we have no evidence that justifies justifies the belief in God, something like that. So I would be a strong well, atheist that, in the sense that, that would be an that would be an invalid argument, though. I, I mean that 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 would be that's literally the black swan fallacy, right? The the that God does not exist because we do not have ev even if I grant the premise that God does. Right, right. No, you're, no, you're, you're, because we do not have evidence to the existence of God. That's literally the black swan fallacy. Right, I'm saying just, it's unreasonable to believe in a God. So it's reasonable to believe God does not exist, but it's not reasonable to believe God does exist because there's no reason to justify it. It's just the null hypothesis. Okay, so then so then you've actually so then it, so then you don't actually say, well, your position isn't God doesn't exist because we don't have evidence for God's existence. Your argument is it's unreasonable to believe in God because we don't have evidence. Right. And then I have a further burden of proof to claim that if we don't have reason to believe it, then it's reasonable to believe it's imaginary and not real. Um, we, we can come back later. So, so, uh, okay. So then you're not actually the type of, so I, I was going to say, well, if you're, you know, kind of the, the classic online atheist that, uh, you know, Christians are theists or are atheists with respect to all other gods, because, you know, uh, you know, for, for whatever that is, and atheism is a lack of belief. Then I would actually say, well, you could uh, then I then I lack a burden to disprove all these other examples that you're giving up. You actually would have the burden to prove them uh, in the same way that the those atheists would want to say, "Well, I don't have a belief. I, I don't have a burden to disprove the existence of God." All right, right, so, right. I'd actually agree with all that, but I would say yeah. that I can support each of those equally to the claim that you can support a God. So I would I could be able to meet that burden. Right. So so then so then we can keep we can uh, we can keep going. Right. So. Um, because I, I've heard you even very recently use something like the flying spaghetti monster. So, uh, so here I want to ask you: Are you specifically going to endorse a a rival concept? Because are are you going to give a specific rival concept, or are you going to do you, basically present your argument? Are you going to present uh, naturalistic pantheism, um, which you're going to have to overcome my hurdle that that's even a coherent concept? Um, and yes, I would disagree with the, the literature on that. Um, or are you going to do the, um, well, we can just list all the, you know, the flying spaghetti monster, you know, we can, we can, the flying, you know, the invisible teapot, all these kinds of, there, there's all these other things that, that could pretend like, 
are, are you going to make a positive case for something? Or are you going to make a negative objection of just, well, we have all these other things? Uh, both. So I'm going to argue for the positive claim that naturalistic pantheism on its own can explain everything equally as well as theism. But I'm also making the claim that all of those alter alternatives like the flying spaghetti monster, panentheism, panentheism, deism, polytheism, transtheism, all of those different things can also do the same thing. So, but I'm, I'm arguing just for naturalistic pantheism in every case, just to demonstrate okay. this for that one example. Uh, we should pick one because we're gonna. Yeah. We're, right. that's, we're trying that's to stick. Why, to a, we're trying to stick to an hour. That's why uh, I, I appreciate it. pantheism. I always yeah. just, that's the only one I defend. I just say these others can do it, but I'm not gonna try and defend them. But this is. But the, let me let me actually let me pick one of them because I think that if I can show, I'm gonna pick the flying spaghetti monster because I think it's the most egregious of them. Okay. Um, and I'm gonna show why if you think that that's the case that all of these are equal rival concepts. I'm going to show that I, I think I can show that there's a problem in your evaluative um, uh, standards, right? So for example, what do you even mean by flying spaghetti monster? Um, they're abstract concepts that refer to something about nature that we haven't discovered yet, which can correlate to the descriptions of what we call flying and spaghetti and monster. So our, our description, our word descriptions aren't literal descriptions of the thing. They're kind of abstract notions that kind of vaguely correlate to the essence of flying, the essence of spaghetti, and the essence of monsterness. Um, so what's the essence of spaghetti that transcends the material world? It's, it's the essence of spaghetti. Like if I said, what's the essence of God? You just say it's the essence of God. I don't know. I don't know. Yeah, except, sp ex except the essence of spaghetti just is a material thing, right? No, it, it, no, it's, no, it's, a, no. it's a material thing that's made of wheat that's rolled out. It's a type of Italian food. No. We have these, we, we have, con if uh, you like Googling things, Google the definition of spaghetti. No, no, no. I, I agree with your definition of spaghetti, but what I'm arguing is that just like you believe that a mind is a non-physical um, extension to the brain, I could say that the essence of spaghetti is a non-physical extension of physical spaghetti. So I could yeah, use but, the same but then argument. I'm ask you, but then I'm going to ask you, do you actually believe that? Of course not. I, I'm not defending the spaghetti monster. So, what does that matter? So, Whether I believe it or not is irrelevant it, to the truth. It matters because if even you don't believe that it's actually a coherent concept, then it actually can't apply. So well, you, it's, in order, there's no in logical order, contradiction there. Order, so it's, it's, I do believe there it's is, coherent. But there is. There, there is because you would actually need to show. I, you would need to have. So in order for um, the, the flying spaghetti monster, for example, to be a rival concept, it needs to be able to explain the transcendental, uh, the, the transcendent laws of logic. It would need to be able to explain uh, the existence of something rather than nothing. It would need to be able to explain uh, a realm of abstract, immaterial, absolute, and universal uh, objective laws of, um, uh, uh, sorry, uh, moral values and duties, right? In order for spaghetti to do that, you need to redefine spaghetti to mean not spaghetti, right? You need to redefine it to something else. So you need to start making these ad hoc adjustments right, 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 to bring it I mean, closer let me, to the existence of God. Let, let, me, let me interject right there. So I would say the exact mm -hmm. same thing applies to you when you say that there is a mind. Because you're simply just redefining the brain and adding this ad hoc thing in addition to the no, brain. No, 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 no. Because I, we, we never, we never, you and I never began on a premise where we both understand that mind is synonymous with brain. Right. We don't grant that. You and I do start on a premise that spaghetti is an Italian food of a wheat base. Uh, that that that's a finite contingent thing that we eat every now and then at Buca di Beppo. We understand. We we both have a have a have a starting place where we agree conceptually of what the finite concept of spaghetti is. That is then developing into these other concepts. You and I do not agree that mind and brain are synonymous concepts. Right. So so for the sake, for the sake of the argument, I'm trying to represent a pastafarian or a hypothetical pastafarian who believes that spaghetti is in fact this transcendental thing that goes beyond the physical thing that we, me and you personally agree on. So for the sake right. of the argument, the pastafarian thinks the same thing about spaghetti that you think about the mind. So but I can then, say for the hypothetical- spaghetti. Then they mean something else besides spaghetti. Right, and I would say the same thing about you. You don't mean consciousness. You don't mean like the brain, which is all we are. You mean something beside that, like which is an ad hoc addition. So I see the same yeah. problem in both arguments. No, because we all have a common concept of uh, we all have a common concept of spaghetti. We do not all have a common concept that mind equals brain. Right, right. So, so the point I'm making is that we can arbitrarily make up any co any topic, any material thing like spaghetti, and we can make an addition to it, just like I think you've made an addition to minds, and they're equally as ad hoc. And the point is to try and demonstrate that. So I agree no, with you. It's not ad hoc because I'm not actually making that adjustment in order to fit a theory. Right, that just is the concept of God that's always been. I'm not, I'm not altering the concept to make it an explanation for a data point. 
Well, right. Neither right. am I. The point of this is just to try I mean, and reflect it with the I most. I mean, that actually is the entire. So we know Pastafarianism isn't a thing. We we know that there's no real person that believes in Pastafarianism. Actually, let's there just, is. But, but, but my point but here. Let's, the, the, but let's, but let's be on. I mean, let's be brutal. Let's not play the trolling game. Let's play. Let's play the we're being well, no, brutal. I mean, game. We know Pastafarianism is is a, is a made up thing in order to do this, right? And so we know that the concept is a a a, a um, is a data in search of an explanation, and the explanation has to be continually modified in order to even try to make it a rival concept to the existence of God, which is not a concept that is that is ad hocly altered to fit the data. Well, so no, 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 I think the, you're, the I think mere you're missing fact the point of the that argument. you have to invent the Pastafarianism just just demonstrates my case that you actually have to make these ad hoc adjustments in order to try to make it a rival concept. Well, no, no, I think you're missing the point here because the point isn't to actually argue that this is a thing. The point is to reflect your own argument. We're using your own argument and simply just changing the nouns around. Great. Then if you're using my same argument, if you're using my same argument, you're using my same concept, then what you mean is God by a different name. No, 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 no. We're using the same, the structure of the argument. We're using a different okay. concept. So we're using so, the same so, structure to say that there is some material okay. thing we have, which is brains in your case and spaghetti in this case. And we're showing that we can go beyond that and add an ad hoc assertion, just like you have added mine to that. We can do the same I'm thing not, with metaphysics. I'm not, ad, I'm not ad hocly adding mine. Well, yeah, that's the, the, the atheist position is that you are. They told, that's all you're doing. But then you're, but then you're not understanding my position. We already have a concept of God as a personal agent. That was already a concept and a belief that we already have. That right, we're, make it any less we're, not, we're not altering the explanation to answer the data question. Therefore, it's not ad. That's not ad hoc. Yeah, right. The, I'm, not, the, I'm not. saying. I'm not saying. Okay. I have this. I have this concept of God. Right. Well, how does it explain something? Um, well, we have this notion of a brain. So I guess to explain it, I need to make an adjustment to the concept of God. So so therefore, I need to make this adjustment such that mind is no longer a brain. That's an ad hoc adjustment. I'm altering the concept to explain the data. Right, right. And that's, that's, what, you're, that's what you're doing with Flying Spaghetti Monster. You have to change the concept in order to fit the data. We're not doing that with... Now, you might disagree with our understanding of mind and brain, but we're not altering and redefining our initial explanation to make it fit the data that's being presented. So it's, it's, just, that, it's just that we have a disagreement on what actually exists. So but we're not making ad hoc adjustments. So as far as we know, the origin of a God is exactly that. We think we see lightning. How is this explained? Well, we can do it. Therefore, let's ad hoc add these new properties of a super being that can do it. So just like people you added ad hoc properties to human nature to think of there's this super being, we're doing the same thing with spaghetti to make it a super spaghetti. So we think you you have, not you personally, or, or the modern theist, but in okay. general, the idea but of then, God is just an ad hoc addition of, to humans. That's all except, it is. But then, but then all you're doing is saying, well, because some ways to get to the existence of God, say, uh, by trying to explain lightning, uh, can be ad hoc. Therefore, uh, all uses of God as an explanation are ad hoc. Right, that that's just a hasty generalization. You well, you don't get to do that. No, I'm saying the origin, the origin of the God concept is. But then you make the question of the origin of the of the God concept. You would need to dem in order for this objection to go through. You would need to demonstrate that then. So now you have a burden of proof. So now you're saying, okay, well, the origin of the God concept is this ad hoc process by which we do there. I'm saying, okay, well, in order to sustain that, you actually need to have the burden of proof to demonstrate that. Feel free to try to do that. By the way, on your way to doing it, you're using the laws of logic, which you need an explanation for, which you haven't provided on your on your on your worldview, which my worldview can. So you're you're presupposing my worldview to use the laws of logic to try to make an objection to an argument to disprove the conclusion that you have to presuppose for it to work. You're going in this in this massively self-reflexively false circle. So right? we do, we, I meet the burden of proof on that because we show from psychological studies and different studies with all kinds of things across the world, that's exactly how those kinds of beliefs have formed uh, regularly. We can see that well, in different cultures. But then, but then you're, but then you're equivocating from a historical development of it. We know where they, the, the idea of God existed and developed historically to why people believe it in all cases, apparently. Right, it's induction. It's why, why individuals psychologically have come to believe it, which, by the way, is the genetic fallacy for whether or not that actually is a true belief based on how they formed it. You're, you're just, you're leapfrogging from fallacy to fallacy. Well, no, that's just induction. You, that's you, the that's you're, induction. You're, if we see it occurring, then we can. Not, we can that's not induction. That's genetic fallacy. No, that's you're induction. Put, you're trying to put. You're, you're putting one bottomless bucket 
into another bottomless bucket and expecting it to hold two buckets worth of water. So, so the second part is one, one that's induction, which is just a scientific method, which does have firm foundation. Second is we do have a bottom bucket. We can let's, let's, go each point. let's go each point. That's wait, not induction. Wait, wait, wait. I want to just go on to the second point. Saying I have a study, you would need to present the studies, but saying I have studies that show that the reason why people believe these is based on these ad hoc assumptions, these ad hoc adjustments of an explanation, which I, I really doubt you have studies to that effect because you, that, that has all kinds of conflations of intrinsic and extrinsic religiosity, has all kinds of philosophical problems. I really doubt any study would be rigorous enough to prove something like that. Let's just type but one and type two errors. We, we, there's a let's name let's for them. Imagine, let's imagine that you have those studies that show that the reason why certain people come to a belief in God is for those ad hoc reasons. Great. That does not, therefore, show that all arguments for the existence of God make those ad hoc adjustments, Correct. or that the existence of God is a is has no reason to believe it, or that Correct. it's false. That God doesn't exist. That would be a genetic fallacy. Correct. So you can't. You can't. If that's correct, you cannot use that as an argument to sustain the claim that the existence of God exists. We can trace the origin of the exist the concept of the existence of God back to these ad hoc assumptions and explanation. You can't get there from there. Right. That only refutes the idea of going through a genetic fallacy. Right. That only refutes the idea that there is a mind outside of the brain. That's the only one it refutes. That wouldn't even refute that. That would just show that, the that, would just show that some people get to the exit get to a belief in the existence of God based on these these bad reasons. That would not show anything like the metaphysical fact, if you're claiming it's a metaphysical fact, that there is no such thing as a mind apart from a brain. Right. No, I'm saying it's an ad hoc no in the world that that study it, doesn't, would it doesn't show it's there's no such thing. It's just it shows it's an ad hoc addition to a mind, just like it shows there's an ad hoc addition to spaghetti showing it's super. No, you complete epistemology with ontology. You'd be explain. You'd be then saying that the existence of it's claiming the existence of a mind uh, is is um, is an ad hoc adjustment. Therefore, that the mind doesn't exist. Apart no, from no, the no. Brain. I'm not saying the mind doesn't exist. That is not at all what I said. I said the justification for belief in the mind is an ad hoc addition. It could still be true. Like I could ad hocly say that spaghetti oh, I, is some metaphysical I, thing that that doesn't show it. I don't think that's the case. I don't think that at all. I mean, we not only are there good and robust philosophical arguments for the existence of a mind apart from a brain, and I and 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 I'll be fully blunt. I'm not a dualist, right? I, I'm what's called a holist, I'm not a materialist. I'm a uh, but I'm not a dualist either. So, uh, but I think there are good there are good arguments that the mind is a thing unto itself apart from the brain. Um, right, right. So my, my argument would be that all of the arguments you can use to show that there is a mind independent from the brain can be equally used to support that there is super spaghetti independent of spaghetti. The evidence for both is equally supported. The way that, that, become, that just becomes so vague that you can say any type of distinction. I can I can say that any argument that you make for any type of distinction of any subject, right? So, um, no. sure. So, so. Uh, if, uh, how, how do I know that you're, you're distinct from a chair, the, the chair that you're sitting on? Um, because I look different. Okay. So then I could say, okay, well, the, uh, the, the existence of the flying spaghetti monster as apart from, um, the, 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 the laughing drowning cow, which is, you know, a, a, it's a similar concept because they look different. You're making the exact same argument. How is that the exact same argument? I'm not following. That's, so, that's my point. Is you can't you can't simply change what? propositional values and arguments and say, well, we're making the exact same argument, because these concepts have certain meanings and values to them, right? The flying spaghetti monster. You're you're you're. It's not the same type of argument simply because you can say, okay, well, I, now I'm going to dump in these other conceptual values into it. Right, uh, I'm, not, I can, I'm, not following. I'm making I'm making the exact same argument that the flying spaghetti monster is different than than the the, the laughing drowning cow because they look different. I'm I'm not following. So so we have one example of something that we can. I, you you don't need to follow and think that it's true. No no, no I'm mean, I'm not following your argument. I don't I don't understand what you're saying. So I can show there is this thing called spaghetti and there is these things called brains. We have empirical evidence of both of these things. And then you want to add an additional property: the mind or the the non-physical spaghetti or whatever, neither of those have an empirical basis. So we can say that there is... Okay, but that again, no theist argument is, we have a brain. Well, that's neat. Um, I now can't explain the data. Um, in order to make it fit the data, I need to add an immaterial mind. 
No, no theistic argument runs that way, right? Because they're not ad hoc. Now, in order to explain that I have a flying spaghetti monster, in order to explain the data, oh, well, it can't actually mean spaghetti. It needs to mean something else. Well, now I need to adjust it to mean something else in order to explain the data. That's an ad hoc adjustment. That's okay. why I'm saying it's not a parallel argument. You have The theistic argument is not ad hoc because we're not making adjustments to the concept to make it fit the data. You think our view is false, and that's fine. We disagree with each other. But the, the, the argument itself is not having to make ad hoc adjustments to the theory to make it fit the data like you have to do with the flying spaghetti monster. So when I ask you, okay, you have a flying spaghetti monster. How is the fly, how can the flying spaghetti monster be the be a similar explanation to God for uh, and rival the the explanatory scope over why there's something rather than nothing, the explanation of the one and the many, why there is an objective transcendent realm of of principles of uh, of true thought, which are laws of logic, why there's an objective realm uh, of, of uh, laws of logic and value, why there are persons, why there are minds, the historical Jesus, the resurrection of the dead, right? In order to explain that, you need to make a trillion ad hoc adjustments to what you mean by the flying spaghetti monster. And every one of those adjustments, in order to explain it, you're bringing the flying spaghetti monster to become more and more conceptually identical to God in order to make it explain all those things such that at the end of the day, the con you can call it the flying spaghetti flibbomon, I don't care. The concept that you're dealing with becomes indistinguishable from the concept that we just originally mean when we're talking about God. So what you're saying is a rival explanation, a rival concept that can explain all these things to the existence of God is an identical concept to the existence of no, God. So that's false. That's immediately false. Else. So this is, this is why I specifically use naturalistic pantheism, which deliberately excludes consciousness so that you can't make that argument. So in the case of the spaghetti monster, it's vague enough that you don't understand the specific differences. But in the concept of naturalistic pantheism, it makes a very specific difference. There is no consciousness. So the point... Um, how, how then can naturalistic... So let, let's do naturalistic pantheism. Okay. Uh, I, I think we can let the listeners decide whether or not I've shown if, if your argumentation style of we have... The, I can throw out I wanted, these things. I wanted to comment one last thing on the spaghetti monster. I wanted to say one last thing about that. So... The spaghetti monster can explain all of those things you listed just like theism can, because all of those things are arguments from ignorance, things we don't know how to explain, which you have slapped the label on. There's no evidence for any of those. Those are all just assertions. And we can make equally justified assertions about the spaghetti monster answering these no. questions. So I, I would, this, this, would this, is just, this, is, this is just the atheist yeah. position. So this is just like a, a representation of the atheist position. But you so, would need to def you, you would right. But again, before right. you keep going a thousand yards down trail, you would need to defend, right? Um, so, so I've said something like the, 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 um, uh, why there is something rather than nothing. Yep. The spaghetti monster right? is eternal, all powerful, and unnecessary, and it can create the universe. No problem. Right. So all you've done is redefine that con those concepts, flying spaghetti no, and monster. That's just inherent in the necessary definition of the thing. Right. <laughs> but it's, you, you've, in again, you've invented it. Nope. You're assuming, you're assuming that those things are the concept that no, I'm just, these are just the necessary concepts of the essence of spaghetti and flying and monster are just inherent in the necessary process of the universe. Okay. Like so then the, the, so then the rival concept is an identical concept to God. You're just no, calling it something. <laughs> no, it's, right, just, so it's the, a different being. So, it has different properties, has different moral statures, has different goals, different motivations. It's a different being. It's like okay. saying that me and you are right. the same. Then what's, what's the different, what is the, what is a specifically different property from the, the, the classical concept of, uh, of God that there is the flying spaghetti monster. The spaghetti monster created the universe so that humans would make spaghetti. Um, okay, we're talking properties, not intentions, right? What is the different properties, uh, the the essential attributes that that have explanatory value, right? Because intention out that that's not explanatory value. What is this when we're, we're dealing with something like omnipotent, omniscient, omnibenevolent, necessary, transcendent, personal? What is the actual different? attribute, the ontological attribute of the being itself that is conceptually distinct between the concept of flying spaghetti monster, not what we actually mean by flying spaghetti or monster, this, this made up concept, what is conceptually distinct from it? Its nature name, is name, such that it has- Name a property that's different. Its nature is different. It has different kinds of- what's the different, uh, what's the, What property is different in its nature? So God has a nature like it's an all good being, so it wanted to create moral beings. Well, spaghetti has, it's an all spaghetti being, so I wanted to create a spaghetti. Okay, so the, so the flying spaghetti monster is is not an all good being. 
No, it's an all spaghetti vegan. It wants per perfect spaghetti. And everything in the universe is created to make spaghetti. And morality is just a consequence of spaghetti. Okay, then you would need to argue that morality is a consequence of spaghetti. And you would have to argue that 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 uh, objective morality is rooted somehow in an, a non uh, a non necessarily omnibenevolent. It, it's not an omnibenevolent being. It cannot ground that that objective feature of reality. So now I ask you, okay, why can the flying spaghetti monster now ground? Because you're going to say it's an equally rival concept. It's an equally rival explanation. Right. Okay, well, an, omni, an omnibenevolent being can ground objective moral values and duties. You've said the flying spaghetti monster in concept is not an omnibenevolent being. How can the nature of the of the flying spaghetti monster ground objective moral values and duties? Because objective moral values and duties follow from the objective spaghetti, so so it's a follow up emergent property. The, the, there, there's there's no there's no correlation to 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 spaghetti because again you you've actually already redefined spaghetti. So spaghetti you you mean well, spaghetti ness? Correlation to the essence of spaghetti. spaghetti. So yeah. Even if it's not the uh, physical kind, so, so you're confusing so, the the physical kind for the essence of spaghetti. I mean, I see you smirking. You know you're trolling. You know what no, I'm getting this is, at. This right? is this, what everything no. I'm saying is exactly what you sound like no. when you're talking to an atheist. No, because because omnibenevolence. There's there's a synthetic link between omnibenevolence and objective moral values and duties. You're smirking because you know you have no friggin' way to tie no, spaghetti no. it. I'm to objective moral. There's no synthetic link between spaghettiness, whatever the hell that means, and objective moral values and duties. So simply saying spaghettiness grounds objective moral values and duties, that's not that that's not a similar explanation no. as an omnibenevolent being grounds objective morality. Those are both moral th that that's a moral explanation for it. No, no, saying the, they, they are the same. That's the point. The reason I'm smirking is because they are equivalent explanations. They're both ad hoc. morality. Well they're they're equivalent explanations because they're both equally ad hoc and baseless. That I'm trying to reflect your own argument as what it but equally again, how ridiculous I, it looks like from the perspective of an what, what okay what ad okay, I don't think you understand what ad hoc means then. What ad hoc change have I made to the concept of God to ground objective moral values in the concept of God? I mean it's all good. I didn't make that as an ad hoc change. That's not a change in order to fit the data. That's part of the original concept of God. We didn't say, okay, well, 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 crap. Now we're stuck. We have objective moral values. How do we explain that? Well, I I okay, guess I now we need to alter God. You know, we didn't think that God was good. Now we need to alter it and say, okay, well, now God is omnibenevolent to explain the data. Like we're not making ad hoc. I'm not. I'm not making an ad hoc adjustment in my argument to you. You have to, right? Well, so let's, imagine, let's, let's, imagine let's, I said this. Okay, well, apologies, apologies. Just interrupt believe, for a second. Do you believe in evolution? Yes, but I apologize. Right. Want, to, want to interrupt for one second? So let's let's say not ad hoc, just an unsupported assertion. So instead of saying it's an ad hoc addition, your claim is an unsupported <laughs> assertion. But then it's not unsupported because it because it abductively gives explanatory that that part of the concept has abductively. Th this is this is again the problem with with kind of um, uh, you're going to cringe at this me saying you're a logical positivist a neological positivist but you are whether you like it or not. I don't need uh, ab abduction. Right, the explanatory scope of something, something that can inductively serve as an, an explanation for something, is a reason to believe if that's part of the original concept. It's not an unsupport. You cannot say, "Well, that explanation doesn't work. That that inductive argument doesn't work because it's an unsupported assertion." No, the argument just is part of the support for the hit for for the claim. That's the purpose of the argument. You can't say the argument doesn't work because. If it's true, then I don't like the conclusion, and so therefore it's an assertion, right? That you you don't get to question beg the, the your conclusion to say, well, then the induction doesn't work. You need to provide a defeater for it, right? God existing as an omnibenevolent being, the evidence for that is that grounds the existence of the objective realm, uh, uh, the realm of objective moral values and duties. That is evidence for the omnibenevolent nature of God. Right, that so, is not, you don't get to say, well, that's an unsupported assertion. Well, I've just given objective reason for why we should believe that's true. No, because that's right? just circular. You just, you said you've, people, no, every, that's not, mm, not circular. Let me, let me, let me, then, let me, let me put out my if, argument. Let me express my argument. If that's me, circular, all me, abduction and induction no, is circular. No, let me, let me express my argument and then you can criticize it. So all properties of God are ad hoc assertions. Gods are made up by human minds. So start start with that as a primitive assumption. That means that everything you say about a god is an ad hoc assertion, and then you're asserting these without evidence. 
because you don't have anything other than philosophical arguments to support them. So there's no way to show they're not just imaginary assertions. So I can just do the same thing and assume that there are infinitely many types of gods of all possible shapes and properties that have all intrinsic possible combinations like the spaghetti monster, which is intrinsically spaghetti. So this isn't an ad hoc assertion. It's just one of the intrinsic possibilities of possible gods. But so it's not because the instant, the, again, it, it, cannot be a, it cannot be a rival concept. So now you've said there's an infinite number of gods. Well, then you mean something else by God than 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 what is than what we mean by the term? Because by God, you 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 cannot have an infinite number of omnipotent beings. That that's, so, that creates logical contradictions. That is not that that's like saying there's an infinite number of married bachelors. You're so, you're, you're you're just you're putting words together, but there's no conceptual. It, it signifies nothing. It's just sound in your theory. definition of a God. You're question begging your definition of God. Your definition. I'm not. Of God I'm not question like, begging. I'm saying there there is a concept of God. We're we're dealing with the concept of God, right? I'm doing an internal critique of your assertions, right? We have a concept of God such that there is no internal contradictions, right? That's the concept that we're dealing with. I don't have to make ad hoc adjustments to it for it to explain the data. You're saying, okay, well, I can present this rival, an infinite number of gods. Well, instantly you have a problem because that's not a rival concept. No, 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 because no. Because that's I, the I don't meaning think, I don't think concept. you're understanding. I think, so I'm saying there is only one necessary being, but there is infinitely many possible ways or contenders for what that necessary being is. So I'm not saying there are an infinite number of gods. I'm saying there's an infinite number of ways the God could be. Um, okay, then you would need to demonstrate that. Right. You would so, need to demonstrate that claim. Yes. So I'm saying that all of the properties that are intrinsic in your God are ad hoc assertions from made up human minds. No. <laughs> and I'm saying the <laughs> you, same you, thing you keep, applies you keep to going all back, of the alternatives. You keep going back to question begging that it's ad hoc. And I've showed you over and over again. Ad hoc means that you take an original concept and you make these little tweaks that you need to make in order to make it explain the data, right? And I'm asking you, show me, I've started the argument with a concept of God. Show me a single ad hoc adjustment that I've made to fit the data. Every single one of its properties. At what point did I say, okay, I have this concept of God. And now you've presented me with a piece of data and I say, oh, that's interesting. My concept can't really explain that. I now need to change the concept in order to make it fit the data. Can you can you give me a timestamp of where yes. I did that in this conversation? Well, not you, human beings in general. So we, we invented a million kinds okay. of gods. Some of them- can you, can you give me evidence for that claim? Yes, people right. invented yeah. millions of kinds of gods. And as they, we discovered things which were inconsistent with those kinds I'm, of I'm gods. Gonna, I'm gonna stop you at each point because you keep trying to go a hundred yards. You, you know you do this. You uh, you keep trying to get a hundred yards downstream, and I'm going to say, okay, I'm going to stop you at each step because you keep building on your steps, and it doesn't work that way. You move from okay. Well, part of my evidence is that people have invented a, a billion different gods. Okay, great. A rival for a rival for evolution. Uh, there there's an infinite number of rivals for evolution. Yes. Yeah. Therefore, evolution is just an ad hoc explanation for for what we see in speciation. No. What we see for the data. Yeah, because I can I can give all these I can give all these rival explanations for the right. exact same data. Right, yeah. but that's not so, the truth. So yours is just that hawk. Well, no, that's not the truth maker. The truth maker for evolution is the fact that it makes predictions. We can verify it. That. It doesn't. I I can come up with I can come up with an infinite number of, of explanations that make the same predictions. Sure, you can, but you can't make them first. Evolution made them first, so evolution has evidence that supports it, or opposed to the alternatives. I, I can I can say that you all invented that as an ad hoc explanation, and that all of these other ones were invented before yours. Well, they could again, have, but again, we, this I one was verified. Play, so so I science works. The same ad hoc troll game is no, the thing. No, that, yours, your example doesn't work. Mine does. So in your your example, we can show <laughs> evolution is supported more than all the alternatives because it made testable predictions before any of the other alternatives. Great. I, I, I can I can give an explanation that makes the exact same testable predictions. But you can't do it before evolution. Evolution was first. Evolution won. How? When? When was evolution first? Uh, when people invented evolution and used it to make testable predictions that were correct and no one else did. Um, so how do you know that, that there wasn't, you know, I can come up with an infinite number of explanations that happened in the multiverse prior to your evolution. Well, that's, that's could be the true, but in case of, since it only applies to our universe, evolution wins. Because, because it could be, therefore, therefore yours is ad hoc too. Well, no, because I'm, I can come up with an no, no, explanation one. That doesn't work because it's still in this ad hoc too. Well, no, that still doesn't work because in our universe, evolution came first. So evolution is more justified than all the alternatives. So we're only Great. aware of the evolution so, one. So the existence of all these other ad hoc ones doesn't mean that you're making ad hoc ones. Correct. Right. And and for me to say that you're making ad hoc ones, I have to beg the question that yours is already false and that yours is making ad hoc ones. No. 
So, yes. so the reason your example I'm is admitting the problem with my argument. I'm, I'm no, telling no, no, no. you. No, the evolution okay. works because we have testable predictions. If you had testable predictions, it wouldn't be an ad hoc assertion. The reason yours is ad hoc is because all the properties of gods were just ad hocly added by human minds to try and fit the data that we discovered as we made but progress. You, and okay, learning. can you, again, but you can't demonstrate that. Well, we have, the only we have way, strong, only... strong evidence of that in psychology and evolution and evo psych and all these scientific fields. We do have strong but evidence you, of all of that. But you don't. You, you, right. you again, again, in order to get that, you're then going into into genetic fallacies, which huh? I've already demonstrated. So, what, what so again, we're, we're going we're going back to you're you're simply, okay. I, I I'm running I'm running out of time, so I don't necessarily want to keep running down this the, down this rabbit trail. Well, well, we can let the listeners decide, right? I, and I have a feeling it's going to be a, however many theists, however many atheists, that's going to be the split on who thinks who is being more reasonable. L let me ask you a question. Because, the, because this this gets at if you're, I don't want to say I, I don't think you're a dishonest person. I don't mean dishonest, but when, when I say how how much you're honestly handling the data and the evidence, I don't mean that you're. I, I don't mean to imply that you're being dishonest, um, right? So, if I were to ask you, is your view falsifiable? Which view? Your your uh, your naturalistic pantheism. Um, well, it's not really my view. It's a hypothetical alternative. So. Okay. Maybe. Well, well, well. Then at that point, I'd say, okay. Well, what's your actual view? Are you a naturalist? Uh, my view is that we don't know anything about the fundamental nature of reality, and we can all make up answers. Okay, but th but then at that point, you're not actually an atheist. You're an agnostic. Well, I'm an atheist towards like certain kinds of gods, like the Christian kind of god, because there are contradictions in its properties and the problem of suffering and those kinds of things. But I would say that it's possible there are other kinds of gods. Yeah. Maybe. Which which I I mean I. I you can follow the podcast. I've shown that the, there's there's no actual contradiction in the attributes and the problem of suffering is actually super weak. Uh, but um, I don't think you've heard my version. Then uh, you can have me back on. I would love to, I would love to discuss Absolutely. it. And I can yeah. Um, so the or, or maybe you can come on mine. How about how about that? Yes. You come on yes, mine. You can argue awesome. for the, you can argue That's for good. the problem of evil. We'll go back and forth. Yeah. Uh, right. So so um, so let's let's say something like uh, naturalistic panentheism or pantheism. Um, uh, is is the position because it's the position you said you're gonna you're gonna push for here whether or not yeah, you're, to you're defend, actually, right right um, I I would have I would have two problems first saying naturalistic pantheism is like saying atheistic theism I I just I don't think it's a again it's a semantic issue you might just need to flesh out the label better and the concept but I just I think it's a meaningless term. Okay, well, just to address that, I could name it. It doesn't make a difference. The title yeah. doesn't actually mean anything. It's just a title, and and, and that's fine. So then, so then I would uh, you know push for for what is actually meant by the concept, and I understand just a necessary it, natural, it, right? Mm -hmm. It's substantively a little bit more than that, but I get that. So what would falsify? What would what evidence would exist that could falsify that as a position? The existence of a god. Contrary okay. God. But what? But you're already saying there's no evidence for the existence of God because all God claims are ad hoc. So what evidence could be presented that would falsify? Because you're going to say no evidence can 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 prove the existence of God because no, no, because of course you can. God is ad hoc. Yes, you, yes, you can. Just pray to a God, heal amputee's limbs, say uh, I believe okay. if God okay. exists, <laughs> cause the material gold brick to show up in front of me. That's evidence of a God. Okay, great. Gold brick, you you pray, gold brick appears in front of you. Why would the thesis God exists? be a better explanation for the existence of the gold brick rather than something like naturalistic pantheism. Because it made the predictions. It was the one that could predict the occurrence before it happened. But why, if, natu if naturalistic pantheism explains everything that's in the reality, including your, your ask, including coming to this point, this, this we'll call this T1 in time, and com coming to T1 where you make that specific request, if naturalistic pantheism explains that, why then does does naturalistic pantheism not equally explain the existence of the gold brick based on your request? Because it was post hoc. It explained after the event. The fact that it explained before event makes it better evidence. So the fact that we made a but, prediction makes it better but then, evidence. But then all you're saying is that 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 anything that comes where the where where we in time try to give an explanation after the fact is therefore post hoc. That's not what post hoc is. Right, then, uh, then, the then, terminology, then, you're, you're being too pedantic here. So the fact that it came after the fact means it's not evidence. The fact that the theistic conclusion made it before is makes it what evidence that's why it's the good evidence it happened before the prediction so so on on so, so do you think that that god exists so on theism god exists necessarily in the infinite past on naturalistic 
pantheism, the necessary natural exists infinitely in the past. How does one of those exist prior as an explanation to at T1, you making the prayer as the explanation? How is either of those more at, at more post hoc than the other? Well, no, ontologically they're equivalent, but the epistemologically they're different. So the fact that I made a claim, I believe X exists, and if X exists, I'm going to predict this consequence, and we see this consequence happen. Epistemically, we're more justified in believing that belief, whatever it is, because it made the prediction. But, but <laughs> you're missing the question, right? Why can naturalistic pantheism not make the prediction that sometime... Yeah. It can make the prediction. There's infinitely many ways to make the predictions, but evidence Great. is whatever so, one comes first. So Great. in physics, in so, physics, so, there's about ten, two dozen different theories, but the one that's the most supported is the Copenhagen interpretation because it was the first one to make the predictions. All the other ones also make the predictions, but the Copenhagen interpretation is the best because it did it first. So it's the majority. Okay. okay. Uh, in that case, you, you've 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 actually just given me the entire argument. Also. Theism theism came first. Theism first predicted that the universe had a finite beginning. Theism first gave an explanation uh, for the existence of an objective realm of abstract and transcendent laws of logic. Theism okay. first gave an explanation uh, for why uh, the natural world is orderly. Theism first gave an explanation. Theism existed before the enlight post enlightenment naturalism and naturalistic pantheism, and it made all those predictions. No, so what you're saying, you're saying, what you're saying is because it has first rights, therefore it's more plausibly true because it made it, it in time, historically, the system made the prediction first. No, it has to be, which, you, which if that's the case, you've just, you, you've now just no, said, you've now no, provided no, me because, no. because your original argument was there's no reason to believe the, the existence of, of God. You've now also set the standard that whatever thesis claims first rights to a prediction, that's evidence that the, the that thesis is true. Correct. Correct. Great. But predictions have theism. specific criteria. You can't just like predict any. But theism had for has first rights for no. the prediction no. 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 of the existence of these things in, in no. reality. For example. So, so again, so again, I understand what you're saying, but I, I want to interrupt really quick. Sorry. So that's yes, fine. if Theism did make predictions. Like if you predicted mm -hmm. Jesus rose from the dead and Jesus rose from the dead, that's great evidence. That's evidence of theism. But which he did, which we have. I, I mean, would, we, I would, I, we, we, have the prior, we have the prior sources predicting the death, burial, and resurrection of the Messiah. It did well, make those predictions. Well, I, I would say that Jesus didn't rise from the dead, but we, we can debate that on your show next time too. So, so my argument would be that the predictions that you're talking about, like the universe had a beginning, there's two options. Either it had a beginning or it was eternal. So mm -hmm. that's not a precise prediction. You have to have something more precise. It began at time X. So right now, the the religious argument that gets it closest is Hinduism, because it argues that the world is 4.8 billion years old or something. So it's the closest. It makes the most precise predictions. Do you, how, how is that? So, I mean, you have Christians so, who so, believe that the universe is billions. I mean, the, right, right, the, no, no, no. So, so the point I'm making is that predictions can't, can't just be predicting the anything. They have, to, they have to meet certain criteria. So predictions have to be testable, falsifiable, verifiable, precise, novel, pure. Great. That's why I'm bringing this up. I'm asking you what would falsify a position, right? Again, you, you, the, the predictions, if, the predictions you have say, to be falsified. If you, say, if you say, imagine I said a prayer and I said, oh, oh, natural pantheism, please, please uh, let, let, let the quantum vacuum produce a gold brick in front of me, right? Uh, theism, doesn't, theism doesn't predict that the, that the, that the quantum vacuum would produce a gold brick. Let's say that it happens. Right. So, the, so, you so, cannot say the, the, the coming to exist, the, the bizarre occurrence of the of the temporal relation of the coming to existence of a gold bar but based on me requesting it. In order to falsify naturalistic pantheism, you would need to give some explicit reason why that would falsify naturalistic pantheism. However, if your standard is that something like a naturalistic, a natural explanation is intrinsically more plausible than a supernatural explanation. Saying God did it, right, will always be, on your view, will always be less plausible than any naturalistic explanation for it. Right, and I don't say that. I never say that. So if you make predictions, if you say, I pray to God that this person's amputee's limb will be healed, that's evidence of a God. I will grant that immediately. That's not better explained by a naturalistic explanation. You make predictions, it works. That's evidence. Why is that? So why is it the case that that can't just be explained by can quantum, be. quantum weirdness, aliens playing a joke on us, can hallucination, be. delusion, 
Uh, or, and, and this is, and this is actually probably more in line of where you fall on, or we don't know science will hopefully figure it out one day, but I'm not going to appeal to an unsupported, unjustified ad hoc claim of a God. So that's the problem of underdetermination. You can always infinitely, infinitely explain any event, but the one that has evidence is the one that can predict it before it happens. You, you, but you're already assuming that you're already assuming your case that that's evidence for something. Right. It's a data point. The existence of the gold bar following a T1 is a data point. Right. Evidence is, is how well it's supported by the explanation. It's evidence of something insofar as it's well supported by the explanation for it. So so I'm asking, why is the existence of the gold bar at T1 when you ask for it evidence for the existence of God and not evidence for the existence of prankster aliens? Right. Again, we can go. We, I, I'm just following. Really, I'm just following Hume on this. Right. I, I'm following Hume's, yeah, Hume's problem of induction. I'm, I'm familiar. Yeah. But not only just Hume's argument from induction, Hume's argument of induction, followed by his objection to miracles, whereby uh, any naturalistic explanation for something, no matter how implausible, is intrinsically more plausible than any supernaturalistic explanation, because you would need evidence of such a type that is more miraculous than the miracle claim itself. Right. I reject Hume's hypothesis, so I don't agree with Hume on that. So, so my position is, is that if you make future testable predictions and you can do it consistently, that's evidence. I don't care what it is evidence of. You can say it's magical leprechauns. You can say it's a god. You can say it's the supernatural. If you can make accurate testable predictions and no one else can, that, that evidence supports your conclusion and nobody else's because you're the okay. only one that can do it. Great. Then, then I would argue that when, when we actually start getting into, you know, we could do like a Bayesian type of analysis of when you put all of these things together that I said at the beginning, why there's something rather than nothing, the, the problem of the one and the many, the existence of immaterial minds, uh, the, the laws of transcendent, transcendent uh, realm of laws of logic, the objective moral values and duties, the personal work of Jesus Christ, uh, the, the, the miraculous coherence of the Bible, the resurrection from the, from the dead after the empty tomb, uh, the, you know, the, the, all, all, all of these things together, and again, we could argue for each one of those things. All of those things together, Christian theism is not is not a thesis whereby we are ad hoc making adjustments for those types of data points. So I, I want right? to get away from this word it's ad hoc. Explanation. It's an explanation that explains all of those mm -hmm. data points. So I want to get the, the word ad hoc is being misused here. If it's unsupported, it doesn't matter if it's ad hoc or post hoc or a retrodiction or a prediction. If it doesn't matter, if you don't have a support okay. for it, it doesn't matter. So right. my position is, is that all those claims are unsupported. And I can, can show that. Can, can inductive and abductive reasoning be support for the belief that yes. something is true? Absolutely. Great. Great. So then if it's the case, so then I don't need to actually prove that God exists in concept to therefore have the argument that God is the best explanation for something. Right. Right. What you're saying is, well, you don't get to have God as the best explanation because the existence of God is unsupported. Okay. Well, if the concept of God is the best explanation for something like this, is, is the unified explanation, then that just is the support for the existence of God. You, you don't get to beg the question that because you haven't demonstrated God first, therefore you can't use it as an explanatory because the right. abductive case for it just is the argument for God's existence. Right, right. So if God was the best explanation, then that is evidence. I agree. My argument is that he's not. He's no better than any of the other ones we can come up with. Okay. And, and, okay. And I'm out of time. So I, I, I'm, I'm just going to have to say, we'll, we'll, we'll throw it back to listeners at that point, because I think I've clearly made the case that those other explanations cannot, they cannot qualify as com competing explanations without making ad hoc changes. Well, again, that you, you keep bringing up ad hoc. Ad hoc is irrelevant here. It doesn't matter it's when not, you add the problem. Because it, ad hoc is relevant in, in, in your objection mind. It's part of my it's part of my case. It's part of my defeater of your argument that I can show that in order to make them rival concept, you have to make conceptual adjustments to make them explain the same set of data Right, because it has to explain all the same set of data that the cons, the singular concept of God does. Right, and again, that's not an argument against my position. Do that the, in order to make people do that, you have to alter the original concept. That's not an again, argument against my position because my point is to do that ad hocly to demonstrate that yours doesn't work. So it's not an argument against my position. You have to show okay, why well, yours is more supported than my explanation. Like if the you make predictions, fact that you just admitted that you have to do it ad hoc is is no, the no, no, reason. That's that's the point of the argument. I don't have to do that. I could make up something completely different from yours that could explain it. The reason I'm doing that is to show you your yeah. explanations don't work. 
the the simple fact that you literally just said i have to i can make up something to equally explain it what you literally just said is i can ad hoc make an explanation yes. to fit the data as a rival right so again i'm Once doing that deliberately i don't have I, to do that i don't have to i can make up something i could do something differently i could come up with different explanations for it <laughs> the why isn't the what i'm doing is i'm using your own methodology to show you're why your methodology I, doesn't work it, but so just but again, ad hoc doesn't isn't an argument against my position. So you'd have to is, actually because, show that no, your no, explanation no. is more reasonable than my explanation. And just calling it's, it ad hoc it, does nothing. It it does because the fact that if you have two explanations, one of them exists non ad hoc. One of them you've already admitted you have to ad hocly advent it to fit the data. The fact that we have that difference between the explanation itself shows that they are not rival explanations. Well, no, because no, I can prove that false. I can prove that false in ten seconds. One of them is. I can prove that false in ten seconds. Okay. So I can say we see UFOs, therefore we had this preconception of aliens. Oh, but I can explain it as something else. I can say, oh no, it could just be like a, a reflection of a satellite or something. Now the reflection of a satellite is an ad hoc addition, but it's still equivalently bad as the alien explanation. The fact that the aliens wasn't ad hoc doesn't make it a good explanation. You still need to show that there's evidence of aliens before right. it's a good explanation. The because fact that the other one's ad hoc is irrelevant. It doesn't matter. Yours is still unsupported. Because the existence of aliens <laughs> doesn't have conceptual necessity of explanatory scope, power, simplicity. At least that I, again, you're just, you're comparing apples to Neither is yours. That's the point. They're just assertions. Those are unsupported assertions, just like aliens is unsupported assertion. Okay. But again, you you cannot say it's unsupported as a rejoinder to the abductive case in which the abductive case is the support for the conclusion, because then you're begging the question of your objection. Right. I'm saying the abductive case doesn't work. I'm not saying that it would. But it only doesn't work because you're begging the question that there's no support, which begs the question the, the objection that the abductive case fails. No, no. For the you're, abductive case to work, you have to present evidence. You have to present some kind of evidence to support the abductive case. If you don't do it, then the abductive case fails, regardless of the hypotheses, the alternatives. Okay. I, again, we're going to throw. I, I think you're showing your philosophical naivete on what abductive arguments even are. Um, so again, we'll, we'll at this point the best explanation. At, at this point, we're going to we're going to uh, we're just going to be keep retrotting the, the the same circles over and over again. All right. Uh, yeah, it was anyway, it was great for you coming on. It was an enjoyable conversation. I'd definitely yeah. like to talk with you about the problem of suffering sometime and the historicity. Those would be interesting to talk about. Absolutely. Absolutely. Well, I'll I'll I'll, I'll bring on we'll, we'll hopefully not have to wait like four months yeah. uh, of scheduling challenges to get there. Awesome. All right. Well, I'm getting hungry. I imagine you are too, so I'll let you go. I appreciate it, man. God bless. Uh I, I hope to talk to you soon. Absolutely. Talk to you later. All right. Bye. Bye.